Members of the House of Delegates, at this time it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce you to my good friend, the President-elect of the California Medical Association, your new president, Dr. James Hay. Uriah Heep said, I am an humble man. I am, and there are so many people that I have to thank. I'm certain I won't remember to thank them all. Now, <clears throat> whether they are or not, they think they're the biggest and best, but the District 1 delegation is clearly the most supportive delegation there is. Would you all please stand? I want to thank you. Thank you. No president gets here on his own, and that the help of the District 1 is great help. My thanks to Tom and Sherry and Bob and all the rest. Some other very special people help too, and I will always thank Richard Frankenstein for winning in 2001 so that I could have the last eight years being this vice speaker and speaker of this wonderful House of Delegates. Bob Reed, now that's San Diego's Bob Reed, not Santa Barbara's Bob Reed. Rosemary Marshall Johnson and Bob Hertzko were the trustees when I was first elected to the board. Each one of them guided me. Bob Reed stepped aside to allow a younger man to keep the seat when San Diego lost a place on the board of trustees. Rosemary became the first woman <laughs> Yeah, I apologize for losing my place because I was trying to remember her first place. Rosemary Marshall Johnson became the first woman vice speaker of this uh, House of Delegates, and she's the one who taught me uh, how to become a certified parliamentarian. And Hertzka, what can you say about Hertzka? And I have learned so much. Still one of my closest friends. I've uh, learned about politics, political action, maybe something about public speaking and not pausing when you're not supposed to, and about creating goals in leadership. My thanks to all of them. Now with me today is most of my professional family with whom I spend more waking hours than I spend with my wife. And would you, as I introduce you, would you please stand up <clears throat> and stay up until I've introduced the whole group, please? Jim Quigley, my partner these past 29 years, and his wife Denise. Richard Payne, I think I, there he is, Richard Payne, who's our practice's glorious leader. Georgine Jorgensen and her husband, Kirk. <laughs> Unable to join us today, two of my partners, uh, Craig Duck, and then uh, mother for the second time just one week ago, Amy Kakamoto. <laughs> now, here also, though, are PA Julie Geimer, and physician assistant uh, Linda Magnus, I think, and husband Craig. Our office manager and people manager extraordinaire, Charlotte Chitwood and her husband Brad. And 17 year employee, of which 10 years were as my medical assistant, now our assistant manager and almost a second daughter, Sue Silvano and Jerry Whitaker. And last but not least, my uh, current medical assistant and perennial prankster, Evelyn Silvano. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, and you may be seated. I can't even tell you how supportive they have been as I've changed schedules, rechanged schedules, asked to have uh, my patients covered as I've been traveling. Uh, they've been fantastic. By being here, I think they show that they're proud of me, and I want to tell you how proud I am to be part of the best family practice in the universe. Thanks. <laughs> Here also are three of the family Tricia and I chose. Ann Beard, George Rice, and Crystal Pritchard. And please welcome again, Pastor Bill and Patty Harmon. 
Thank you. And you may be seated. Finally, my own family, daughter, Dr. Beverly Hay, chair of the Gen Department of Genetics at University of Massachusetts in Worcester, her husband, Mark Adler, and our grandson, Linus. My son, Todd, Yahoo's most important manager, and his soon-to-be nurse wife, Allison, and their three children, Carson, Harper, and James. And my in-laws, 94-year-old Pat and 95-year-old Lydia Jones, and I did ask their permission to tell you their ages, and they... <clears throat> And Pat and Lydia still house and cat sit for us every time Trish and I leave town. And, of course, the speaker in my house and the only one in my wildest dreams, Trisha. I love you all and thank you for being here to support me. Now, buckle up, because this isn't going to be one of those tell them what they want to hear speeches, I promise you. I want to talk about PPP, and I'm not talking about urologically unacceptable protoplasm. <clears throat> I want to talk about POGO, our plans, and our profession. Now, with the O's in there, I guess that could be poop. You decide. But I will add that in every survey the speakers did after one of these House of Delegates meetings, many of you complained about having too many speeches. Well, here's why these speeches are important. You need to know what your leaders are about and what they think is important. And your job is to tell us whether you, if you think differently. I need to talk about POGO to give you the context for what I think is important and I need to finish up by talking about our profession because that's why we're here in the first place and it is why what we do here is so important. Now, <clears throat> those of you that have heard me speak as I've gone around the state and visited you in your counties this past year have heard me describe my theme. Walt Kelly was one of the, probably the greatest satirical cartoonist ever and his opossum character Pogo who Dustin tells me he's never heard of, <laughs> is remembered to this day for saying, we have met the enemy and he is us. I'm really tired of hearing myself and my peers use the language of victims. If there is an enemy and if we are its victims, then what have we done to ourselves and how do we fix it? If we had the problem, or the power to create the problems, then we certainly have the power to fix them. If you think that the health plans are the great enemy, then who embraced PPO contracting in the first place and signed the contracts? We did. Who thought that by creating IPAs and groups in order to contract with the HMOs, we could take patients and income away from our peers? We did. And who accepted the largesse of the pharmaceutical companies, comma, and device companies, <clears throat> for notepads, pens, dinners, trips, for CME, journal financing, so that we wouldn't have to, and for control of almost all clinical research. And then, who complained because they take 11% of the healthcare dollar? We did. We chose to be independent when larger, more integrated systems do it better and cheaper. We resisted adapting to the electronic age when almost all other industries showed us the way. We ordered tests and services and consultations when we often knew that they were unnecessary and then wondered why the health plans pay us so poorly. We expected hospitals to pay our medical staff expenses and now we even expect hospitals to pay for the formation of the ACOs not recognizing that we collectively have the ability to do that ourselves. 
We pushed our hospitals and surgery centers to supply the latest when the latest wasn't necessarily necessary, thereby driving up the costs, thereby further competing with our own incomes. And some of our peers sold out to hospitals, foundations, groups, and gave away the control of our practices to the suits. Often we are the suits. So what about right here at CMA? So many prior surveys and focus groups of both members and non-members alike have said that what we do here, what the interest we serve in this house, the interests that are served by the Board of Trustees, the County Medical Societies, and the special, Specialty Societies are not their interests. By avoiding change in the way we do our business in organized medicine, haven't we guaranteed the 1.5% decline in membership year after year, all the while the California physician population is growing 2 to 3% per year? Are we willing to look at how we govern ourselves, at how we are organized, how we interact with our peers, members or not, and how we interact with the public? If not, we, the enemy, have triumphed over ourselves, and there will be no CMA, no county medical societies, no specialty societies. In an eye-opening book about the situation in the Middle East, son of Hamas, Mossab Hassan Youssef said, as long as we continue to search for enemies anywhere but inside ourselves, there will always be a Middle East problem. I learned to judge political candidates from Hertzka by the Hertzka rule. Do the politicians think that we are part of the problem or we are part of the solution? So I challenge then all of us to see all of our peers, the agitatingly annoying solos, the market gobbling large group docs, the irritatingly negative about organized medicine academics, and yeah, the power-hungry trustees and officers, all of our peers as part of the solution because we collectively created the problem. If we treat every one of us as part of the team, then what can't we accomplish? How many famous authors have to tell us the same thing? In an epidemic 1879 Argentine poem, Jose Hernandez writes, when a family fights among themselves, they are soon eaten up by strangers. And one of my favorites by George Will, the health of a political persuasion can be inversely proportional to the amount of time its adherents spend expelling heretics from the one true and steadily smaller church. And very recently, David Brooks reminded us that citizenship, after all, is built on an awareness that we are not all that special, but are instead enmeshed in a common enterprise. In other words, we as individuals aren't that special, nor can we define the one true church, nor can we define the order within the family, but we collectively, we the profession of medicine, we are indeed very special. So what is possible? I mean, they say that's what politics is the art of, the possible. Let's just take a cursory look at what we've already done. CMA created the first public health department in the nation. And also, way before our time, CMA, together with the CHA, created the uh, uh, Good Samaritan Law. CMA led the way towards at least reducing, if not yet eliminating, the terrible health risk in tobacco. And then later, uh, created the Tobacco Free California 2000 campaign. MICRA still stands as the envy of the nation's doctors. More recently, our Board of Trustees started the RICO lawsuits, and we were later joined by 18 other states, and that was an effort that changed the way health plans had to deal with us and returned millions of dollars to the unfairly unreimbursed physicians. And this House adopted reports B-102 and B-104 that set the stage for how that we would uh, enter ourselves into the debate about health system reform. And that, by the way, was a position better taken than what that was taken by the AMA. 
Now those are just the highlights. But what about also the generation-long struggle for uh, medical staff self-governance? That's, that's something that we have now introduced into law based on the principles adopted here at this house. You and I did that. What about the fight to get HIV recognized as a public health and not a political issue? We did that. And what about all the bad ideas we kill every year in the legislature, like the disease of the month regulations? We work to see that reason prevails, well, at least most of the time. So what's next? Well, let me suggest just a few things. And first and foremost, in my view, we need to set goals and big goals, like Kennedy's race to the moon or Lincoln's determination that the union was more important than any particular political persuasion. And I think we need to think bigger and stop playing defense. Our uh, lowly San Diego Padres, Hertzka, have proven that having the best pitching and the best on-field defense still leaves you in the cellar if you can't hit. So what's our offense? Where's our hitting? If we don't have an offense, it's time. It's time to have an offensive strategy. Well, how about recreating the market the way the tech industry does? Instead of fighting each other for pieces of a dwindling market, what about enlarging the market? How many more patient services and patient coordination could we deliver if we had 25% of the health care dollar instead of our current 19? We should be looking at how the market can and should expand, and not for our own bottom lines, but for what we can deliver with more resources. Can we do a better job with pharma and reduce the need for meds so that their share falls, falls down to 8%? Can we keep people at home and out of hospitals and SNFs with better prevention in home care and decrease their shares by 2 to 3%? There is no shame in having the incomes that we do. We all know and shouldn't be afraid to say that we defer beginning an income earning career a minimum of 11 years. And then we end up with huge debts at the very beginning. And then we're expected to be infallible and have to pay hugely whenever we're not. My son Todd taught me a lesson in economics many years ago. He has an MBA and he works for Yahoo now and he's been in the tech industry for a long time. Todd, as a businessman, decides what he wants, whether that's a, a product or an income, and then designs a pathway to get there. Workers, like us, decide what we want to do, and then we hope somebody that'll pay us fairly for it and we hope that our product is good because we are. Maybe it's time to think about the ends, a better profession, a more secure economic environment, a healthier and safer public, and then design to get a way to get there, like Todd does in his business every day. If we're going to think bigger, we also have to think outside of this room. We should be building coalitions to achieve our goals, like Dustin and his team did with labor to help protect MICRA. But again, why just defend MICRA year after year instead of, how about aligning with education, local governments, business, as well as with labor to create legal reform for everyone? Philip Howard's books like uh, The Death of Common Sense in America and Life Without Lawyers certainly demonstrate how badly our society has been harmed by our lawsuit culture. Also, if we think we're the victims of the oligarchic health plans, why haven't we developed coalitions with business, labor, and governments, all of whom are suffering under the rapidly rising cost of health care? Also, you know, we've talked for so many years about enlisting the public to help our causes. There is no better time than right now to begin doing that. We have the technology, the people, and the intelligence to tell our story to the public. And the public includes those physician peers who haven't yet recognized why they should be members. It's time we do that regularly, not when the next crisis comes up. All of the doctors in California 
need to know who we are and what we stand for. And to get there, we need to engage them. Former Secretary of State Dean Rusk said, one of, our, one of the best ways to persuade others is with your ears, by listening to them. So maybe we need to spend some more time listening, polling, doing focus groups. And speaking of coalitions, how long will we continue to think that we compete with specialty and ethnic societies for membership and allegiance? Remember the mile of cars? Isn't it funny how when competitors all line up together, they all do better? Finally, we must take the lead in making the transitions that are necessary not only to survive, but to thrive. Love it or hate it, that means adapting to the changes brought about by the ACA. Like it or not, that means helping solo doctors integrate, virtually or actually, so that they can compete and enjoy the mode of practice they've chosen. And it also means finding out what a membership organization has to offer to all these new physicians coming out who over three-fourths of the time now are becoming employees. What do we have to offer them that their employer can't or won't support? I suspect it will have a lot to do with the same things that you and I want control of our futures. We can be General Motors and watch the world pass us by, or we can be Ford, learn from our critics and from our failures, and change the way on what we give in our products so we can give to the public and to our patients what they want and what they need instead of us telling them what we think they need. And we can remind them and ourselves that we can control our destiny, we can control our profession, we are not victims, and we are not the enemy. It would be a cliche to say that this is the most memorable moment in my professional life. It would be a cliche, but it wouldn't be true, because I suspect that the most memorable moment in my professional life is the same as it was in yours, the day we graduated from medical school. I mean, I've had other memorable moments, like the day Beverly graduated from medical school, and the night that Be uh, Todd called me to ask what to do about his sick child, and the day that 88-year-old Eleanor came to my office for the last time because she was moving away for her final days to be closer to her family. She put her arms around me and she cried because she was losing her longtime trusted physician. You have those memorable moments too, because you're a doctor. And it isn't really me or you, as David Brooks pointed out. We're not that special. It's the profession we have embraced that means so much to people and that defines so much of who we are. We are doctors. We have the moments here too like the standing ovation at the Board of Trustees that day we decided to go ahead with the RICO lawsuits. Who can think bigger than any one of us? CMA can. Who can develop the coalitions to achieve the goals of our patients and our members? CMA can. And who can help the doctors regain the control of their lives and of our profession? CMA can. It is the love of our profession that has led me to this place after a 25-year journey that began in one of those seats. This is a proud day for me, and I thank you for it. But another proud and memorable day will be in when Carson or Harper or James or Linus follows Beverly and me and you and joins this most wonderful of professions. George Will said in a column recently on his 70th birthday and about our profession that contemporary America's most pressing domestic problem is a consequence of success. We will address that most pressing problem because we are doctors and because we are CMA.
On behalf of CMA, it's my pleasure to continue a tradition of bestowing the Presidential Medal uh, to Dr. Jim Hay, and I can't tell you how proud I am of him. Ms. Trisha Hay, please approach, please. This also continues a, a superb CMA tradition, a, a floral, bouquet, floral bouquet on behalf of CMA to Mrs. Hay.